Welcome to the Living Wholehearted Podcast, where we're helping leaders live with integrity. Whether you're a mom or a CEO, you're a leader, and how you lead matters. Well, welcome. It's the month of Valentine's, and we want to wrap up this month with a fun and down-to-earth leadership couple, Sean and Marina Mitchell. And you might remember that Marina had a candid conversation with Tara at the beginning of 2020 around healthy habits with our body, soul, and marriage. And if you want to check that out, episode 10 and 11. And uh, I'm joined here today with uh, with my lovely wife, Tara, who has been a little under the weather, so she doesn't quite sound exactly like you've expected to hear from her, but good morning, honey. Good morning. <laughs> a little nasally, so bear with me. Uh, so we decided to invite uh, the other half of Marina and are so excited to hear more from you, Sean. Um, I wanted to be able to explore a little bit more what integrity means and how that looks. Uh, we talk about integrity a lot at Living Wholehearted and believe that it's more about who you are than what you do. Um, and it's a way of being. Uh, we love how you two have so much fun together and have learned a lot as we've just watched and listened to the things that you're doing. All right. So Sean and Marina, first things first. Before we dive any further, uh, tell us about how you guys met. And everybody loves a love story. And it's Valentine's Day. Today is actually Valentine's Day. (laughs) Straight up. So first of all, I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to talk about um, how much I love my wife on Valentine's Day. (laughs) You're welcome. Big points now. And a whole bunch of people are going to listen to this. And then, wow, it's major points. Yeah, it's awesome. So back in the day, we were in uh, Bible college together down in California. Um, We met um, on campus at what was called then Pacific Christian College and is now called Hope International University. It's in Fullerton. We were both students there and we started, um, actually we started at the same time. Um, I was coming in, I had um, about uh, four years of architecture school um, under my belt and had decided to go into ministry. So I went there. And um, Marina was just a little bit younger than me and transferred over from Cal State. And um, I remember seeing her the first day that I was there on campus. I was talking with um, a buddy of mine that I knew from summer camps and stuff like that. He was a youth pastor at a local church. And uh, this super, super cute um, gal starts walking up um, into the quad and she's smiling and she's all peppy and feisty looking and stuff. And she was, <laughs> she was in this like volleyball outfit. Okay. And, uh, so then I heard the angels start to sing ah, and, yeah. and all of the firecrackers started going off and all of this. And I'm like, who is that? And he said, Oh, that's Marina. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow. So that's how I met her. <laughs> yes. Okay, so from my perspective, yes. he was much older than me, and he rode a motorcycle, and he had a mullet. What? So <laughs> we might be dating Represent. ourselves. Okay, let's get something straight. Mullets were really cool <laughs> sure. back then. I don't know then. if they ever were cool, Sean. I know, Sean. Oh, wow. I no, they were. Know. The baseball um, cap, for sure. Jeff had a mullet, too. That's okay. Yes. I mean business yeah. in the front part mm-hmm. of the back. Right. That's right. Yes. Totally rad. Yep. Yeah, so we began, um, actually, our first date was running. Our second date was surfing. Oh, fun. That says a lot about you yeah. guys. And then our third date was country dancing. So we just, we are all about having a good time. That's the spirit. Yes, yes. So we knew right away, though, honestly, um, we both had just come out of relationships that were f- semi-unhealthy, um, for us anyway, and it was like, whoa. So, yeah, we were engaged within six months. Fast and furious. I mean, yeah, get her fast. done. You knew that you knew. Get her done. <laughs> get her done. <laughs> yeah. That is a lot like you guys. So tell us right. a little more where you're at in the stage of life. Yeah, so we've been married for 26 and a half years. Um, actually, today is the exact date because we were married on August 14th. So Valentine's Day is kind of a half year anniversary for us every Isn't year. Isn't that sweet? He remembers that. That, that is sweet. Oh, Brownie anyway. points for you. I yeah, know. More points. Just some more points. Um, we have two kids. Um, our daughter turns 23 in just uh, like, what, three days? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And our son is uh, 20. And um, daughter lives in Arizona. And our son, actually, our son is a sophomore at the same school that we went to. Oh, oh you're cool. That's yeah. awesome. So, yeah, it's really neat. Yeah. So we are empty nesters and 
We thought we'd be real sad, and we're having a blast. That's the spirit. <laughs> Seriously, we're having so much fun. It's yeah. so good. Well, it, uh, it's fun to hear uh, and to see you guys today and hear a bit more of your story. We want to hear and share with our audience a little bit more about who you guys are. And, and Sean, having you today, uh, we'd love to hear a little bit more about Catalyst, your mission and how it all began, and how is this flowing from who you are as opposed to other, from other seasons of your life? Yeah, so Catalyst is a group of people who really want to get busy about the mission of Jesus. Um, we started Catalyst in 2007. Um, we had been in traditional church ministry for 13 years. I was a youth pastor um, at uh, a couple of churches in California, and then um, another church up in Everett, Washington, and had some really wonderful years um, and uh, really learned a lot about ministry and family and um, and how to serve God in different capacities. Um, we moved up to Oregon um, initially to plant a new church. And so I was a church planter, um, started a, a small congregation called Potter's Hands in the Tiger Beaverton area. And that was just an awesome adventure. Um, it's interesting because we, you know, of course we were we were kind of at that phase of life where we'd learned a lot. We'd both, uh, my partner and I had been in ministry for 10 years. And so we pretty much thought we knew everything, you know, at that point. So we were going to go start a church and we were going to do it right, you know. And so what was interesting is it didn't take very long before we started feeling some of the same pressures that a lot of other traditional churches suffer, suffer through. So we had some success in reaching people who were looking for a new church, um, which was really, really cool. And we saw people come to faith in Christ, and um, we saw this uh, new little church community kind of um, solidify, and some really wonderful things happen. What was interesting was at the same time, we were trying to live very, very missionally in our neighborhood. We were making friends um, with people in the community, um, with families that our kids went to school with, and all of that. And um, we were feeling really, really drawn to these people um, that God had sent us to reach. That's what you do when you start a new church, right? You um, start kind of the church organization, and then you make friendships with people, and then hopefully, right, they come to your church. That's kind of the conventional way of thinking. What ended up happening was we made a lot of friends, and God really blessed us in that way. And it seems like just about all of those people came to visit our church once and they never came back. So we had a dilemma. Um, and of course, this is, you know, putting in a nutshell what, you know, a process that took about three years. Um, we really felt like we needed to extricate ourselves from the organization of church so that we could go in a different direction to reach people who were interested in God, but they just didn't want to go to church. Mm -hmm. So at that time, we started what became Catalyst. Over the years, we have started lots of different groups with different uh, types of people. Um, people have come to faith. Uh, we baptize some people. Um, uh, many of them have filtered into local churches. Uh, it's really, really been a blessing um, just to see what God has done in untraditional ways outside of the walls of normal church ministry. We also got really busy with um, doing acts of service. As we read the New Testament, Jesus and his followers were doing all kinds of things to bless the community around them. And we know through history that the early church was very well known for being just ridiculously generous with their time, very compassionate, and they were just serving the community. And so we started doing stuff. I had gone um, part-time in um, construction work just to help ends meet and um, became a licensed general contractor. And we started doing benefit projects for some of our neighbors. And um, it, so it started off very, very small. Um, we did a project for a lady who lives two doors down from us. 
And uh, she just needed a few things around her home. So um, we took one of our church groups that met in our home, and we went over there on a Sunday afternoon, and we uh, changed out a broken toilet. We painted her kitchen, fixed her doorbell. Um, our kids did crafts with her. <laughs> um, yes. You know, like we just did, we just fussed around her house. And so it was for us, it was a nice way to give and um you know, it meant a lot to us to do that. But for her, we just, we couldn't believe it. It totally changed this lady's life. And so she asked us, you know, in the process of this, like it really blew her away. It was like she won the lottery. <laughs> and she was asking us about like, well, why are you doing this? Why are you being so generous? And we just answered her questions. We said, well, we're followers of Jesus. And we think this is the kind of stuff he would do if he was here in the flesh. And she asked if she could come to our home church. And we said, nah, you know, it's kind of a closed group. <laughs> right. Yeah. Closed door. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Closed door. No, that was not the answer we gave. So she became part of our, our house church and um, she read her Bible for the first time in her life. Um, and she prayed out loud for the first time. She was asking all these questions. So she came to faith in the midst of this little group in our house because we fixed her toilet and painted her kitchen. Mm. And so we said, wow, let's do another project. That's it. Okay. And then we did another one. And then we did another one and another one. And the rest is history. That was uh, that first project for that neighbor was 13 years ago. Wow. Oh, yeah. And so over the years, we've worked with um, literally thousands of volunteers, and we've done hundreds of projects. We just, uh, I just was looking at our statistics the other day, and um, we just did a project last week, and it was project number 310, yeah. which is pretty ridiculous. That's but awesome. Yeah, when you think construction, and you think about what that looks like in each project, Usually is, I mean, is there's a there's a large scope to to something that needs to be done for someone, yeah. Yeah, and I think I would insert in there um, for the listener kind of the reality mm. of the transition between normal church and then doing what we did specifically for our first several years um, was very challenging. It was challenging because we were now focused on the community and trying to help people so much, but we really lost. And I'll speak specifically for myself. I really lost everything that um, church brings. Mm -hmm. So we found, you know, we really learned a lot in that first couple of years. And although, you know, the way Sean says it, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty, and we can really swing it very positively. It is amazingly positive, and it's awesome. Mm -hmm. But it was not easy. Right. It was a, a rough transition for us. Um, definitely the way that God wanted us to go. And I would just throw in there too, one of the things, um, just to kind of broaden what he was saying about the people we wanted to reach, um, we one of the questions God gave me on a walk one day before we made this huge jump out of traditional ministry was, what if all of the churches on the corners in the city disappeared? Mm -hmm. okay. Would the people of the city be sad or glad? Mm -hmm. And part of me, especially in the Northwest, I felt like they would be kind of glad because then they could use that property for something else mm -hmm. that was more meaningful to their community. So in that scope of knowledge, I feel like the Lord said, make my house, my people, my building, my church, make it impactful to the community. Mm -hmm so that they do not ever want to see it leave. Mm -hmm. right. So that was part of the reason I could jump off what I thought was fairly safe. I mean, I am an extrovert. I need people. I love church. I love the get-togethers. I love all of that. And so that first year was really challenging for me. Um, yeah. Sure. I mean, but that calling and that um, kind of picture the Lord gave me mm -hmm. pushed me forward. Yeah, yeah. that's a, often um, a question as people will say, when's it time to mm. shift gears? I mean, it sounds like you were going one direction and it just took a major left turn. But it, it wasn't maybe a moment in time. It was a process and clarifying along the way. And you were responding to the fruit of what was happening right? Uh, instead of going out. I mean, so often, I, I love it. You said you thought you were going to plant this church and it didn't quite go the way 
you thought. Right, mm. right. And yet it was a process to get you to where you are today. Mm-hmm. So Marina, what what has been your piece and catalyst? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we have been married, like we said, 26 and a half years. When we first got married, we still had a semester left in Bible college. Um, and with amazing intentions, a lot of people spoke into our lives because we're both kind of a lot. We had just a friend the other day tell us we're both a little extra. <laughs> so I think, A little extra. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah. Cherry on top. Um, yeah. So a little bit of us goes a long way, but um, it can make us stand out just a little bit. And so professors and pastors of churches really looked into our um, partnership as like, whoa, you're going to be really impactful for the kingdom, which I think is a sweet intention, although it could put young people on a real high expectation path. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Basically, sure. I was being told I was all that. That's right. And so I went out kind of thinking that I was. And basically, I think in a lot of different ways over the years through traditional ministry and even much more recently, I really have gotten my butt kicked. Uh-huh. And some of that butt kicking was directly from the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. He has a way of kind of coming into our lives at strategic moments and, you know, kind of grinding down our rough edges and bringing about humility. And that's one of my primary lessons. And uh, we've come to the place now where we can look back and really appreciate that, but it's different. It's really difficult to sometimes yeah. go through it. Yeah. So, graduating together and getting into ministry. I mean, we were just hand in hand thinking we're going to do all this together. And we did actually for a long time, years and years, we worked together. The call of Catalyst outside of traditional church was absolutely for both of us. The transition and the reality after that um, was much more challenging for me than I had anticipated And again, to keep it really real for the listeners, because we never want anyone to look in and assume, you know, unicorns and rainbows and roses. Um, What we have now is amazing and we love it. But it, I would say the past decade has been very challenging to figure out specifically for me, um, what is my calling? And I, I don't know, maybe it was a decade ago, eight or 10 years ago, we finally had to sit down, and I remember exactly where we were because it was mm. a really impactful conversation. And I had to finally admit to Sean that his calling was not my calling. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's big. It was huge, actually, because he was pretty disappointed because I wasn't as involved. And my zeal and excitement for the ministry was really waning, and I was tired, and I was lonely, and I just needed people. And I really wasn't living yet out of what I was supposed to be doing because, I mean, really, we got married in the early 90s. And, you know, at that time, it's very much the pastor's wife is quiet, submissive, and helpful, right? I am supposed to be his helpmate. And I am a feisty, spicy, a very driven woman that was trying to settle into this quiet lady in the corner who plays the piano, right? <laughs> and I don't yeah, play the piano. That. I love that. Well, yeah. so it was such a transition for me hmm. to really ask God, okay, I am really not satisfied. Yeah. <laughs> I'm struggling, and yet what I feel called to is a whole different kind of ministry. I am a fitness professional, meaning I teach fitness classes. I educate the teachers and instructors as well. And it is out in the world. And as we talked before, it's um, in spandex, sweating and jumping around on a stage with a microphone. I'm encouraging them to be healthy with their body. Um, So it's awesome. I love it, love it, love it. But it took me so many years to finally... um, settle into that that is what God called me to do. And he uses that. But what Sean is doing with Catalyst, and I'm still involved, I'm on the board, I help with the fundraisers, I love all of that, but I'm really not into construction. So let's be honest, that's not fun for me. So I would rather go and bring the coffee and talk to people and serve the lunch. Um, But I don't want to swing a hammer. And at first that I felt a lot of shame, honestly, like, oh, great. We started this ministry and I don't like it. I can understand that. Yeah. Yeah, Sure. Um, And so it's it's odd like that. But now, I mean, we've come to such a great um, 
balance in that, but it it took a lot of years for me to feel comfortable stepping out a bit, allowing that to be his calling and me going in a little bit different direction. Yeah. That, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. You guys have spoken to this about how you kind of got started in this direction of Catalyst and also into your relative, well, not relatively new mm. calling, but uh, mm. but how do, you, how do you think someone discovers how to live more? from how they are made. Mm. Like I, you have a lot of wisdom here to offer this because you've journeyed this together and it's, you, it's been hard, but it's been, um, it's amazing now. Mm. What you have now yeah. is amazing. Uh, either of you can answer that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's kind of the million dollar question. I think that we all instinctively know that we were put here for a reason. Mm. And those of us who know and follow Jesus really put all of our hopes in him. Um, I don't know how people, how people come to terms with what their identity is and what the meaning of their lives are without that. Mm -hmm. But I can speak to the, what it is when Jesus is part of the picture. Um, I think it really, when it comes to how, how do you find that out? I think just from my own story, um, it came with a sense of surrender uh, a surrendering to whatever, that's really where it starts, surrendering to whatever we're feeling like we're holding on to that is holding us back from what God has for us. Mm. Okay. Mm. Um, there's this old, there's this old um, analogy, and it had to do with uh, the, the mechanism for how they catch monkeys, right? And so what you do is you get a coconut, you put a little hole in the coconut, um, that's um, just a little bit bigger than a monkey's hand. And then you fill up that, that coconut with some fruit or something that the monkey wants. And then you just, you set it in an open patch and then you hide behind a tree and you wait. Monkey comes by, smells the fruit, sticks his hand in the inside of the coconut to get what's in there and has the stuff in his hand. And then his hand's too big to get out of the hole. But the monkey's too stupid to let the stuff go and turn the coconut upside down. And so the monkey just stands there screaming and howling because his fist is too big to get out of the hole. And I think a lot of times in our relationships with God, we just hold on to stuff and we will not let go of it. We want, I think what we want is we want God to bless us and we want him to keep us safe and we want all of the blessings that come with God, but we want to do it when our hands are full of the stuff that give us a false sense of contentment or peace or fulfill our desires or whatever. And our journey in understanding who we are begins when we let go. It's big. Mm. It's it reminded me of uh, just the other day I was reading a journal entry, uh, in 2013, and I really uh, was given that word surrender. And I was just overwhelmed by what happened from 2013 to today, mm -hmm. and that letting go. And I, that was my prayer, is just, I'm, I'm giving it all wherever you lead, whatever you want. And I remember that sense of, mm. I, I don't know what I'm, I don't know what's ahead, mm. but I want what you want, God, not what what I want. And honestly, seven years later, I'm just in awe, hmm. I'm in awe. And so that same mm -hmm. kind of sense for you, it's not easy. I think that's the false thought is people think, well, if it's God's plan, then it's easy. Oh, oh boy. Yeah. That is such a lie too. Oh yeah. Cause then we go, well, then it must not be God, hmm. um, but it's worth it. And I'm just hearing that from your story. So our time is wrapping up, but I want to hear a couple more things before we wrap up. Um, you mentioned what keeps people from pursuing their dreams. Often it's holding on to uh, tight mm. to what they think. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you would think that is hindering people from being able to step into who God made them to be and the call he has for their life? Yeah, I um, I was just going to interject this a little bit into what Sean was talking about. I One thing that we have discovered in our old age, quote unquote, right? All the years of living and experience, seeking Jesus, letting things go, surrendering, all of that stuff, is that we are emotionally unhealthy 
And I think that we believe that once we come to Jesus, all that wipes away, and then we just get to do whatever He wants. Mm -hmm. But the hard reality is what He wants is to heal us. And that takes a really long process, and it takes experiences that we may or may not want to go through. So when I think of what has it taken for us to really see what God has for us, yes, it's been a ton of surrender. It has been a lot of heart work with God. It's been, we both have been in therapy. It's been the most amazing things to uncover because God is amazing. It could heal us in an instant, but I think most times he chooses not to do that because our process of becoming healed is what he's actually going to use. Mm -hmm. And I have kind of stomped my foot a couple times at him like, hey, I have done this, this, and this for you. And why have you not healed this from my childhood? And he still is, right? At 48, I feel like, oh, this is the year I am letting go of this. Or he's opened up a breakthrough in this area of my life. And so the myth that you know, you come to Jesus and everything's amazing, and then He just lays out this golden path for you, and you just follow it, and everything's beautiful. Um, it's a myth, yeah, yeah. and I think if we can attack the areas of our life that are unhealthy, which all of us have them, I don't care what home you grew up in, we all have them. Um, then he, it allows Him to just open our eyes to what we're supposed to do. Mm. That's what I would say. He's not going to waste anything. No right? way. Yeah, and, mm. and it's a process. He loves us too much for That's that. That's right. It's gonna, he's going to go into all those points, and and uh, he's a, uh, the Bible refers to our Father as a good physician. What Marina was talking about has to do with identity, and our identity is defined by Jesus himself and by no other. And... A lot of times what we have to do is we have to release a lot of those false definitions that we've believed about ourselves or things that have been spoken over us or titles that we have worn or lies that we've believed based on things that have happened to us or whatever so that we can come to Jesus empty handed. And then he tells us who we are, mm. what he knows to be true about us defines us. It's what's real. And so we come to him to define who we are uniquely, you know, in our personality, our spiritual gifts, our experiences, all the different ways that he, you know, invented us uniquely as individuals. And that all goes into our calling. And we have assignments that happen on a daily basis or a weekly, monthly, yearly basis, but our calling from him and who he knows us to be never changes. No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we are going to hear more from Sean and Marina. And in, at the top of the next episode, we're going to ask you a little bit about telling a story about how Catalyst is changing lives. So if you gave us a little tip about that. We'd like to hear another. And until next time, how can our listeners, listeners find out more about Catalyst or support what you're doing? www.catalystnw.org. And that's spelled C A T A. L Y S T N W like Northwest dot O R G. You can learn about us there. Definitely check that out. You two are such a dynamic couple. And uh, what did you say? You're a lot. Uh, <laughs> extra. Or extra. extra. You're extra. <laughs> and I really love the extra. I really yeah. do. I, um, and so we're excited to hear more. So make sure you tune in to part two. And until then, just take a nugget from today. There were so many good pieces of wisdom that I think that maybe God was speaking to you directly. And so whichever part stood out to you, that's what you were supposed to listen to today. And so until then, just remember that God is using you right where you are. Thank you for joining us and being a leader committed to shrinking the integrity gap between the values we espouse and the values we actually live out in practice.